There's 100 billion stars in the Milky Way, and our best guess is that 20% of them have a habitable planet around them. So that's 20 billion stars. That's a lot of stars. But the issue is we're separated not just by space, distance, we're separated by time. So one of the interesting analogies that uh, I'll be talking about tonight is humans have been on this planet for 100,000 years. So the Earth's been around for 4.54 billion years. So if we were to collapse the entire life of the Earth into a single day, humans have been around for the last two seconds of the day. The rest of the time, clock was going around, there were no humans here. We've only been around to communicate with extraterrestrials, if you want to think of it that way, for probably 25 of those 100,000 years. Now imagine another civilization comes into being, even in the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, where if there was one there and they decided they wanted to talk to us, we could probably talk to them. But what's the odds that that civilization will be around at the same time we're around? Well, it depends on how long they live, okay? Let's say they live for a thousand years, then the chance is infinitesimal. If they live for billions of years, then the chance is pretty good. But we don't know, and one of the interesting paradoxes is that when we look out through space, there is no evidence, in my opinion, that we have been in contact with a advanced civilization. And yet, an advanced civilization that can move from star to star will have almost certainly moved to every star because they've had enough time, 10 times more time, uh, to move around the galaxy than uh, they need, even at very slow speeds that we travel right now. So the fact that we haven't been inundated by aliens sort of indicates that uh, civilizations like us are either short-lived or, and, or, and or they don't travel between stars. So I think the chances of actually meeting an alien and shaking hands with them are pretty small. And I'm not sure if I were an alien civilization, I'd want to meet a human, because my guess is it's not going to end up good. You know, we'll be threatened by them, or they will be threatening to us, and it won't be, it'll be one way or the other. So it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, it would surprise me. But I would say it's not zero likelihood that we could make contact. At least we would realize there's a civilization out there by their light or, you know, radio transmissions. I think there's a chance that that could happen. It's remarkable what humanity's been able to do. We've been able to, by working together for the past 5,000 years, uh, we've been able to build up this amazing understanding of the world around us that allows us to have what is, you know, for many people, very prosperous lives. But when I look to the future, I realize we can continue on a path where things get better for more and more people, or we can go on a path where that's not true. And uh, science provides a bridge, a means, by making life better for more and more people. But it alone is not enough. Humans have to decide to share our information, uh, and then ultimately share wealth and to help each other out in times of trouble as we try to cope with a world that is going to need to support 9 billion people over the you know, coming decades. And that's a lot of people. And so I think science has the ability to allow us to cope with 9 billion people, but only if we work well together. And so as an astronomer, uh, you know, I have knowledge of science, but as a Nobel Prize winner, I've had the luxury, I guess, of being able to meet many of the smartest people in the world, uh, leaders, uh, you know, various thought leaders, whatever. And, you know, this is a very consistent picture that is held by many of, uh, of these people that I meet. And so I think it's important when I get the chance to talk about things that are not just today, they are about the future, I think it's important to talk about it because we need to think about it. You know, the future, a great future for the world is not guaranteed. It's going to require effort and some sacrifice. And we need to start thinking about that now. I meet politicians and there are a lot of them out there who are convinced for whatever reason that climate change is not happening. And if it is happening, it's not due to humans. This will be the only 
thing within science that they have opinion on. They will all tell me, oh, I don't know anything about science, but this climate change stuff's crap. And then, you know, so we need to have that conversation again and again, and the evidence is going to become stronger and stronger, and it's not going to be easy to ignore in another 20 years. So the, you know, the change of climate uh, is something that we have evidence for, uh, and in the end, like most bits of evidence, where, where do you look uh, for advice on evidence from the experts? And this is a place where science should be providing, you know, the, the advice to government. And it should be the advice that government should be willing to take. Now, what they act upon it, that's a very different question. That's a political question. But in the U.S., the U.S. has something called the National Research Council. It has been very clear on its advice to Congress and the U.S. government about climate change. Why would this be the area that they wouldn't believe the evidence? I don't know. It's not logical. And people across the country, you know, when the New York subway system starts filling up with water on a regular basis, people in New York are kind of convinced there's something funny going on because that hasn't happened in the past. And, uh, you know, these things are going to start building up. The evidence will become absolute and people will have to, to act on it. In the end, climate change isn't going to kill us. It's going to be the conflict that climate change causes. That, that's what's going to kill us.